On July 2nd, 1863, 3rd Corps Commander Dan Sickles would move his men from his position on Cemetery Ridge forward to a place called the Peach Orchard. Right back there, that's the Peach Orchard. Next to the Peach Orchard is the Wheat Field, next to the Wheat Field is Devil's Den, and next to Devil's Den is the base of the Round Tops. Well, he would move his men forward and form a salient. That's probably a word you've heard tons of times, especially when you're thinking about the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, there's a few problems with this. He physically didn't have enough men to take and hold this area. Second, he was exposed now, and not only was he exposed, now the rest of the Union line was exposed because now there was a giant gap. And third, he didn't tell anyone he did this. Now, being here, you can kind of understand why Sickles moved his men forward. His position on Cemetery Ridge, you really couldn't see a whole lot. So on July 2nd, when he was coming through this area, he would see the Peach Orchard bordering the Emmitsburg Road, and he would make a mental note of that. Well, he did this because a few months earlier at the Battle of Chancellorsville, there was a position called Hazel Grove, and Hazel Grove was high ground in front of the Union line. Sickles requested to man this position. He was told no, and Confederates would occupy this position and use it as an artillery platform and bombard the Union line. So Sickles, being here at Gettysburg, saw this as another example of the high ground being utilized against him. So he would push his men forward. And we're going to explore the area in and around the Peach Orchard, and we're going to cover one of my favorite regiments of the American Civil War. So I've moved just south of the Peach Orchard here, and like I always try and do, I just want to orient you as to where we are here. So you see the wood line before us here. That is the area where Longstreet were launched his assault from. And the Confederate forces, before launching their assault, they had no idea that Sickles moved his men forward. They were going off information that they've received um, prior to the day prior. And when they would emerge here, they would see Sickles' line, and that would cause some delays because they would have to swing wider out to execute the Confederates' plan, which would cause some delays. But by this time, the Confederates would advance across the field. There would be some fighting at the Slider Farm between the 2nd U.S. Sharpshooters and some Alabama regiments. And then the Confederate forces would begin to sweep this way and into Devil's Den and to the wheat field. But we are going to work our way back up through the peach orchard here and we're going to explore the grounds where one of the most successful Confederate charges, and impressive I may add, uh, took place here. So now we're to the right of the Peach Orchard, which would have been Sickles' right flank on the salient here. And this is the former grounds of the Wentz House. You can see some of the remains in front of us here. And straight ahead, you can see some structures in the distance there. This is where a Mississippi Brigade, under the command of William Barksdale, would launch one of the more impressive and effective charges of the war. Now you see this field before us. They would be across this field within minutes, shrieking like the devils, as uh, some Union soldiers would quote. And they would slam into the Union units here. On this end here, you would have the 2nd New Hampshire, and then you would have the 114th Pennsylvania, and as we make our way to the Sherfy house here in the barn, you would have the 57th Pennsylvania and the 105th Pennsylvania. And then on the right flank of them, you would have some regiments from New York, I believe the 71st and the 72nd. But you would have the 18th, the 13th, the 17th, and the 21st Mississippi under the command of Barksdale. And they would slam into this unit here and pretty much route the Union forces here on Sickles' right flank. So I made my way across the Emmitsburg Road and I just wanted to show you the uh, Shurfee property here. Now Barksdale's men would come across this field before us here. The Union would have uh, several skirmishers out front, but obviously they were no match. And they couldn't slow down Barksdale's assault. Well, this barn here actually kind of has a sad story attached to it. Now we mentioned this property here was in the middle of the fighting here at the Peach Orchard. Well, as the fighting ensued, this barn here would uh, fill up with Union casualties. Now at some point in the battle here, this barn would catch fire. And like we just stated, it was filled with wounded soldiers, some of which were too wounded to move. So as the fire raged, a lot of the uh, soldiers within the barn here would burn alive. And I believe a lot of them were from the 114th Pennsylvania Zouave unit. Um, There's even accounts of Confederate soldiers coming through this area, trying to pull out some of the wounded soldiers, but to no avail. So we've made our way back across the Emmitsburg Road, and now we're behind the Union line. They would have been positioned along the Emmitsburg Road here. Barksdale has now began to push them back through this field here. And in an attempt to slow down the surge of Mississippians, the 73rd New York, you can see their monument behind me. They would be brought up and start forming their line of battle right here behind us here. 
So before we go over the actions of the 73rd New York here at the Peach Orchard, I wanted to share their monument with you. And this is by far one of my favorite monuments here on the battlefield of Gettysburg. As you can see, the figure to the left is a firefighter and the figure to the right is a soldier. And the 73rd New York Infantry was known as the Second Fire Zwaves. And now they were predominantly made up of firemen from the many volunteer fire companies of New York City. Many of them actually wore their respected fire company badges on their uniform. So they would exchange their fire trumpets and hoses for muskets to uh, answer Lincoln's call for volunteers. Now, they're known as the Second Fire Zwaves because the 11th New York Volunteer Infantry was known as the First Fire Zwaves. Now, at this point in the war, the 11th New York was mustered out of service, but they did see some combat at Bull Run on the right flank of Henry Hill, and they saw some action in the Peninsula Campaign, but the 11th would be mustered out of service shortly after that, and many of their members were spread out among the Army of the Potomac. So, now, all that's left is these second fire zwaves here at the Peach Orchard, and they were forming their line of battle just beyond the monument here. But I just wanted to share their story with you and their awesome monument. You can see the firefighter there holding his trumpet, which would have been used for communication, and he had his firefighter helmet there, and what they would have looked like once they laid down their trumpets and turned in their fire helmets and picked up their muskets. So this is the general location where the 73rd New York would have been held in reserve. And you can see their marker here, 73rd New York Infantry of Sickles Brigade. Now, once the Union line began to falter to our front, the 73rd would be brought forward and they would halt on the high ground here just before the Wentz House. And they'd begin clashing with the 13th and 17th Mississippi of Barksdale's Brigade. And I have an account from Captain James Morin who was in command of Company H of the 73rd New York that I want to share with you. Not far from our regiment's position, several guns that had made havoc among the advancing Confederates were in intimate danger of being taken. A caisson had been blown to atoms. The horses killed and most of the officers and men killed or wounded. As our line began to retire, a mounted officer implored us to save his guns. Amid the sounds of bursting shells, cheers mingled with shouts, and the general confusion of the moment, it was almost impossible to hear or be heard. And what I mistook for the consent of Major Burns, I called for the men of my company and those nearest to me, follow me and the mounted officer and drag away the imperiled guns. A minute later, a shell burst. A fragment wounded me in the ankle and what felt like burning powder entered my eye. Our line, now in considerable disorder, retired and for a few minutes we were in the perfect tornado of bullets and shells from both friends and foe. The open field affording no shelter. At last, the enemy came hard upon us. As the center of the 13th Mississippi passed over me, the men firing and shrieking like Indians, a volley from our side, tore through their ranks and some of the Confederates fell. I had never in my experience seen such havoc from a single volley and its effect was instantly manifested. The line of battle came to a halt without command and it took the utmost exertions of the Confederate officers to prevent panic. Now one of the most compelling accounts, at least to me, from Captain Morin was as he was laying in this field, the Confederates would pass over him and the 73rd New York was slowly being driven back and he would watch this fight and one of his accounts said he was literally watching his regiment melt away, the lines growing thinner and thinner. So that just gives you a glimpse into how savage the fighting truly was just on this short field behind us here. So just behind the 73rd New York monument is a monument to the entire Excelsior Brigade which consisted of the 78th New York, the 71st, the 72nd, the 73rd like we just covered, and the 74th New York. And they were all engaged here in and around the Peach Orchard. And since we're covering the 73rd Fire Zwaves here, 51 killed, 103 wounded, and 8 missing. And that's a grand total of 162 casualties here. And as you recall, when they took the field, they had about 350 men. It's a common thing here at Gettysburg. These regiments are taking the field and only fractions are able to leave the field here. So we've been predominantly focusing on the 73rd New York at the Peach Orchard. Obviously, there was a lot more going on, but we can't visit the Peach Orchard, talk about Dan Sickles, and use words like salient, and not see the very spot where Dan Sickles would actually lose his leg to a Confederate cannonball. And since we changed locations, I'll reorient you as to where we are. You can actually see the 73rd New York Monument in that area there. My fat finger probably missed it, but that is the Peach Orchard and we're back a couple hundred yards and uh, we're here at the Trossel Barn. So here is the marker claiming 
This is where General Dan Sickles, sitting atop his horse, would be hit by a cannonball in his right leg. Now, apparently the horse would survive and wouldn't even have a scratch on it. And some say that the horse flinched at the last second, thus leaving uh, the horse unscathed. But if you're wondering where this marker is, it is at the trossel barn here. And I got another little nugget for you I want to show you on the trossel barn. So in the distance there was the Dan Sickles marker that we just visited, and this is the trossel barn. And I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but right there, you see that hole? That is a hole from a Confederate artillery shell. And if you don't believe me, here's a picture from the trossel barn just after the Battle of Gettysburg here. And here's the unexploded shell that was found in the attic of this barn, if barns even have attics. But this area is relevant also because Captain John Bigelow's 9th Massachusetts Battery would be positioned here. And his six 12-pound Napoleons and 110 men that were manning those guns were essentially being sacrificed to buy time for the uh, Union Army here. The Confederates would be advancing across this field here, and Bigelow's guns would be firing point-blank into the Confederate forces. And some hand-to-hand -hand combat would take place, and the Confederates would capture four of the guns here before uh, Bigelow's battery would finally retire. Just another example of a unit being sacrificed for the greater good of the army. It's uh, pretty evident here at Gettysburg, happening time and time again. So that was a brief synopsis about the 73rd New York Infantry here at the Peach Orchard. Um, one of my favorite things about the Civil War is just how unique uh, some of the regiments are on both sides. Um, you can find tons of stories about these regiments. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the story about the 73rd New York, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one.